Welcome to the Deadly Addictions channel. I am Joseph F. Olsis, Addiction Master on most social media. Today I'm going to be talking about five medical innovations in 2020. So I found this article, I thought I'd do a little recap. It is titled, Five Medical Innovations You Probably Didn't Notice Happened in 2020. It's from a website called Healthline. It is written by Brian Mastroianni. Mastroianni. And it was fact-checked also. All right. It says, even in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, the medical community made advances throughout 2020. Here are five of the year's most impactful innovations. As always, I'll put the link in the description, but normally I'll just read the article, mostly word for word. Here and there, I'll inject something, and at the end, I'll do a little wrap-up. Okay. I'll begin now. Overall... 2020 has been a tumultuous year. From a health perspective, it's been one turned upside down with a deadly global pandemic reorienting how we live our lives and relate to others. The COVID-19 pandemic has justifiably dominated headlines and attention from media, policymakers, and health officials alike. While it's clearly the defining public health, cultural, economic, even political event of the year, the pandemic shouldn't obscure the fact that 2020 was also a time of great medical innovation. From breakthroughs in oncology, gene therapies, and heart health, to the development of COVID-19 vaccines that are now being administered domestically and around the world. There's a lot of the medical community that can be proud of in 2020. Healthline touched base with leading experts about some of the most impactful medical advances of the year, and how they hint at a more hopeful tomorrow. 1. The Year of the Genetic Code Almost every expert Healthline interviewed agreed that gene editing was one of the big stories of the year. In October, Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer A. Dudna were awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for discovering the CRISPR-Cas9 genetic scissors. Just five other women have won this prize before. The gene scissor tool is what it sounds like. Enzymes snip out pieces of DNA to restore them to their normal function. Dr. William Morris, Executive Medical Director of Cleveland Clinic Innovations, told Healthline. Charpentier and Dudna showed that these genetic tools could be controlled to cut any kind of DNA molecule at a designated location not just distinguish DNA from viruses, as these scissors exist in their natural form. Essentially, it means we can rewrite the code of life, according to the Nobel Prize's official announcement. There are links, by the way, highlighted words. You can go to other, you know, things that connect to the article. Mara said that this innovation had wide-ranging ramifications for people who have a wide range of genetic conditions. He cited sickle cell disease, a condition where malinformed or malformed sickle-shaped red blood cells cause blockages in blood flow, preventing the protein hemoglobin from effectively ferrying needed oxygen through the body. Morris said these microscopic tools can cut out these genetic errors. There have only been a handful of drugs to treat these kinds of conditions in the past. Now, this kind of development allows you to remove the error and replace the genetic code, kind of like in your computer or your iPhone. If you downloaded a patch for a new software to repair an app that always crashes. That's what this is, Morris explained. It's so earth-shatteringly amazing to tell these patients who otherwise face an entire lifetime of pain and suffering, you can now use the word cure, which is unbelievable to think about, he said. Oliver Elemento, Ph.D., Director of Englander Institute for Precision Medicine at Y.L. Cornell Medicine in New York City, told Healthline that 2020 is the year of the genetic code. We're able to use the genetic code in humans and viruses to help humanity in ways we were not equipped to before, in ways we couldn't do before, Elemento said. Elemento. <laughs> I'll use that for a villain name. I run my adventures. I'm continuing. 
He added that gene therapy in general, along with the CRISPR technology, is pretty extraordinary. This more comprehensive understanding of genetics extends beyond the Nobel Prize. For instance, Elemental said, while Cornell Medicine, where he currently works, along with the New York Presbyterian Hospital and Illuminia Inc., recently announced an innovative an initiative to sequence the genome of thousands of patients. The more we understand about genetics and gene therapies, the more improved our precision medicine capacity will be, opening up the possibilities of creating targeted therapies for all kinds of conditions. Now, we've noticed a lot of controversy around the CRISPR thing and some guy in China going on the run now because he you know, messed with babies, uh, if I'm correct. So that's pretty interesting. Number two. Breakthroughs in Heart Disease and Stroke Research Recently, the American Heart Association released its own list of innovations in medical treatments. Also, it's highlighted. There is a link to an outside source. The spotlight includes a new Phase 3 study that could change the way hypertrophic cardiomyopathy cardiomyopathy when the heart muscle think it thickens and can stiffen, is treated. It also highlights new treatments that might change up the first-line treatment for arterial fibr fibrillation, AFIB, a new minimally invasive surgery to prevent stroke, and a new trial that reveals more treatment might not ne necessarily mean better treatment for coronary disease. American Heart Association President Dr. Mitchell S. V. Elkind MS F A A N F A H A Steve, that's for you. Wrote in an email to Healthline that all of these advances over the past year reflect connections between seemingly disparate areas of medicine and the fact that we are most successful when we break down the barriers between fields. In order to tackle an issue as wide ranging as heart disease, for instance, it takes an interdisciplinary comprehensive approach. For example, we learned more this year about the unexpected ways in which medicines designed to treat diabetes, the sodium glucose transporter 2 inhibitors, or SGLT2 inhibitors, help patients with heart failure, even those without diabetes, he had. Elkine also cited our growing understanding of how connections between infectious diseases like the flu and COVID-19 are tied to greater risk for heart disease and stroke. Often, the most important advances occur when experts from different areas of work together in creative ways to solve a difficult problem, he wrote. When asked if there was one particular heart innovation that stood out amongst him, the most to him, Elkine said that what resonated with him was something not tied to fancy medications or groundbreaking research. An analysis of people from across the U.S., showed that rates of blood pressure control have begun to decline in the U.S. after almost two decades of better control. High blood pressure is one of the most important and easily treated risk factors for stroke and heart disease. And so this is backsliding is especially alarming, he added. He stressed that the study, also highlighted, you can link to it, you can find it, also pointed to the impact that having health insurance has on control has on controlling one's blood pressure. Those with some form of health insurance had blood pressure control rates of 43 to 54%. While those without insurance, it was only 24%, Elkine explained. Improving access to quality care is one of the best ways we have to improve health. And that is where we at the American Heart Association will be placing our efforts in the coming years, he said. That's important. And another for Medicare for all, you know, get everybody covered in the richest country in the world. Uh -uh -uh. Number three, oncology advancements, preventative techniques to targeted therapies. Benjamin Neal, MD, PhD, director of the Pearl Mother Cancer Center at NYU Langone Health, said 2020 has been a year that's seen cancer research pushed forward on multiple fronts. He said technologies are in development for early detection of cancer by way of blood tests. 
It's been known for quite some time that tumors release DNA into the bloodstream. We have technology developing from the standpoint of monitoring tumors, conducting sensitive tests for tumors, the tests for reoccurrence of cancers, and protein-based tests, Neil told Healthline, outlining current research. He also cited technology that modulates the regulatory DNA sequence patterns, which refers to the part of the DNA molecule that can change the way a gene expresses itself in a living thing. To pinpoint when methyl, methylation uh, me, <laughs> patterns might point to the development of cancer. By the way, that word methylation is also highlighted, leads to an article on it. Among other research highlights over the past year, Neil said researchers have been developing new ways of drugging genetic mutations. He mentioned work being done in developing a compound to degrade the androgen, androgen, androgen receptor for prostate cancer cells, what allows these cancer cells to grow. Number four, democratizing access to medical care. Well, one of the biggest changes this year came in the form of how our new normal Work from home lifestyle has impacted medicine. As more and more people stay away from offices and public spaces, they're turning to telemedicine. The Zoom screen is the new doctor's office. Mara said that while this isn't a medical discovery per se, it is it's a crucial, in some ways life-saving, development for how we relate to healthcare in our lives. Out of this whole pandemic, one of the things we've discovered as clinicians is that we need to see patients when they are and not force them to cross state lines. Morris said, while we had telemedicine, we had some patients over Skype and video visits. There were clear disincentives and policies in place against people easily crossing state lines to seek medical care or receiving medical care remotely. He said the pandemic facilitated a push at the government level and with state and federal regulators to reduce barriers to these tools that are critical lifelines for patients. Even when healthcare professionals couldn't always see patients in person this year, the embrace of telemedicine has resulted in unprecedented increases in the adoption and use of these tools and seeking care, Morris said. This pandemic, this pandemic has challenged us to question old perceptions and policies so that, uh, so that was a very positive thing, he stressed. Innovation doesn't necessarily have to be an aha moment in a lab or something right in front of us, he said. It's unfortunate we needed a pandemic or a challenge to sometimes see a barrier, uh, and sometimes that barrier is us. You know, it's interesting, you know, I saw um, an article, I was reading up on something that had to do with Maybe phone apps or computer apps that'll let the uh, a scan scan you in some sense, or going to little uh, kiosk on the corner and whatever you go in and it scans you. So that was pretty interesting. This is a you know it's a you know he says it's a shame we have to have a pandemic to do this, right? I'll continue. Five a blood test for Alzheimer's disease. This year, a possible breakthrough in Alzheimer's disease research and treatment came in the form of a blood test that can diagnose this progressive form of dementia. By the way, Alzheimer's disease and the blood tests are highlighted. They'll link to the articles. While the news is huge, the test is still in the trial phase. If ultimately approved, a simple test for the condition would be a game changer. There are as many as 5 million people living with Alzheimer's in the United States, a number that will likely triple by 2060, according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC. While this test has yet to go through all the proper approvals, a company distributed the first publicly available Alzheimer's blood test this fall. Ah, uh, that's... There are a lot of areas that something like this is coming up where they're going to be able to tell you, like, in... Five years, you know, you're most likely to have cancer or things like that. That's interesting. A look to the future. 
As 2020 comes to a close, experts are looking to a more hopeful new year. For its part, Cleveland Clinic, which enters its centennial next year, released a list of the predicted top 10 innovations of 2021. Morris said that while many think of this year as fraught and divisive, full of tragedy and setbacks, looking back at these innovations shows there's always something to be grateful for and look forward to. Elemento said that he expects a biotech and farmer boom in the next few years. Citing breakthroughs in gene therapies and genetic manipulation indicate what will be a continual embrace of this kind of medical technology. All these technologies, now everyone knows they exist and that they can be used for good. There will be a big boom for these technologies, Elemento said. Edit. So that's the end of the article. It's from Healthline website. Written by, who's the name again? Brian Mastriani. And this is interesting. There's a lot of these. This one came across my, you know, daily fucking looking around the internet. But there are many other ones. Uh, there, the, you know, the 10 breakthroughs of 2021 so far. I like to go and look for these things sometimes on purpose just to see what is on the cusp of happening, what's close. Because when you hear all these and read and hit all these clickbait type things, there are lots of, um, this is working cancer on mice and this and that. And as someone who does a little bit of deep dives on these things and who really is excited about these breakthroughs, they're not always, um, you know, to the point, meaning it's someone like with a name that writes the article and it links to the study. And when you look at the study and you do a deep dive from that, well, you know, it might be 10 to 15 years away. And the article will show that it's going to a certain trial, but it's like kind of, you know, it's worded and framed in a certain way. And in this case, you can look at what were the innovations. So what did happen? And I think that's a, an important type of thing to do. We have a year that went by that was fucking crazy. It's just a nightmare. And we're not even out of it. My company went under. I'm just scrambling to get as much work as I can. People are still worried about immune, you know, and respiratory people who are you know vulnerable to these things. And it's looking better on the front with the vaccines and such, but that'll have to settle in. And again, a lot of these things you look at, some of the people are like, well, uh, you know, this is a conspiracy and it's putting chips in you or something like that. Well, I don't know what to tell people like that. You have such a big, wide industry. You have thousands of people, researchers and scientists. Yes, I do believe that there are conspiracies to a certain extent. But we can't just neglect the consensus of the medical industry. And like I said, that's why it's good to sometimes do a podcast like this that highlights an article that shows you the innovations that did happen. Not exactly framing it and showing articles that are leading to further tests that are saying, you know, I don't like to give false hope in that sense. So it's like one of the deep dives I did was, okay, if I could live to 76, I might be able to live at 76 for another good 40 years. Meaning by the time I'm 46 and I'm 50 right now, there'll be enough medical breakthroughs nanotechnology, that type of thing. Well, let me stay 76. I'm not saying I'm going to de-age, but I'm going to live a healthy 76 where most people would degrade. So when I do a lot of deep dives and I watch these 11 hour, um, you know, lectures and they bring up numerous people over weeks of time showing what they're doing, you can get a better understanding of what's actually going on. Yes, this the, they did these tests, whatever, but there's still going to be a little time before the next advancement. So I hope people enjoy it. Besides me fumbling through the words and fucking, sometimes the names are just, you know, even though I, I read it once or twice beforehand, and depending on how high I am and what I'm doing, I might just open it. But I thought this was interesting. I think it's something I want to do maybe mid-year 
end of year. Next one I'll do is probably uh, in, in this category, let's say, would be innovations of 2021. And to show that not only are we working on things, let the conspiracies blend into that, fine. But what did we do? What were the innovations? I know people they are excited, get a better understanding, not to dash people's hopes, but to see, look, these are the things we're still doing them. We're moving forward. We're trying to make the best of everything. And, you know, we can just have faith in some things. And not blind faith, like religion, but an understanding of trust built up by people who are still out there working to make us better, healthier people. Now, if we had a great government, that would be different. Living in America and Brooklyn, New York, it could be fucking crazy and nerve-wracking and frustrating. So, five medical innovations that you probably didn't know that happened in 2020. I hope you are a little excited, understanding that these things did happen, and I wish you all the best. Take care, everybody.